Hello, and welcome to this Federalist Society virtual event. My name is Jack Derwin, and I'm Associate Director of the Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. Today, we're excited to host a panel discussion titled Section 230 Goes to Court, Gonzalez v. Google and the Future of the Electronic Town Square. Joining us for this discussion is an impressive panel of experts who bring a range of, of uh, excuse me, of views to the topic at hand. In the interest of time, we'll keep intros brief at the outset here, but you can view our speakers' full bios at fedsoc.org. Our moderator today is Boyd Garriott, who is an associate at Wiley Ryan, where he litigates and provides regulatory advice for a wide variety of telecommunications and technology clients. Prior to Wiley, Boyd clerked on the United States District Court for the District of Columbia and attended Harvard Law School. After a discussion between our panelists, we'll go to audience Q&A if we have time remaining, so please enter any questions for our speakers into the Q&A function at the bottom right of your window. Finally, I'll note that as always, all expressions of opinion on today's program are those of our guest speakers. With that, I will pass it over to you, Boyd. Thanks so much, Jack. Um, and yeah, just want to reiterate, uh, are these panelists uh, are real all-star bunch, uh, people who have thought a lot about Section 230 and Gonzalez versus Google. Um, so really excited to have a discussion uh, with everyone today. Um, so we have with us today Ash Kazaryan. Uh, she's a senior fellow of free speech and peace at Stand Together. She's a tech policy expert and has previously worked at Meta and Tech Freedom, focusing on Section 230 and a variety of other tech issues. Ash is regularly featured as an expert commentator in a variety of different media outlets, including CNBC, the BBC, and Politico. We've also got with us Joel Thayer, the president of the Digital Progress Institute. Joel has previously worked on communications and technology issues as an associate at Phillips Lytle and before that at ACT, the App Association. Joel's work has been featured in numerous publications, including the Wall Street Journal, Newsweek, and The Hill. And last but not least, Randy May is the founder and president of the Free State Foundation. He has been in the weeds on communications, administrative, and regulatory law issues in both think tanks and at major national law firms for over four decades. Randy has authored or edited eight books and published more than 200 articles and essays in leading national legal periodicals, including Legal Times and the National Law Journal. Before I hand uh, the reins over to our panel of experts, um, I just want to give a 10,000 foot overview of Gonzalez versus Google uh, and Section 230 um, to just do some table setting uh, for our discussion today. Um, so starting with Section 230, uh, the origin of this law can really be traced back to 1995 when a New York state court in a case called Stratton Oakmont held that a website could be held liable as a publisher of defamatory statements posted by third parties on its online bulletin board. The next year, in 1996, Congress enacted the Communications Decency Act, seeking to promote free expression on the internet and to remove disincentives for platforms to block or filter harmful content. Relevant to today's discussion, Section 230C1 says that providers of interactive computer services are not to be, quote, treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. Taking this language, the courts of appeals have for many years interpreted this provision quite broadly. But in 2020, Justice Thomas, in a statement respecting a denial of cert, called for the Supreme Court to review Section 230 in a future case. Justice Thomas opined that the lower courts had afforded more immunity to platforms than the text of Section 230 could bear. It's against this background that the Supreme Court decided in October to hear Gonzalez versus Google a case which concerns what counts as being a, quote, publisher or speaker of information under Section 230C1. <clears throat> the facts of this case stem from a 2015 terrorist attack in Paris in which ISIS adherents killed a young woman named Nahimi Gonzalez. Gonzalez's family sued Google under the theory that its platform, YouTube, is secondarily liable for aiding and abetting ISIS by allegedly hosting some of that organization's videos and using algorithms to recommend those videos to users. The Ninth Circuit held that Section 230 barred these claims because YouTube's recommendation algorithms are neutral tools that present content provided by third parties, placing those tools squarely within the grant of publisher immunity afforded by Section 230C1. But Judges Berzon and Gould wrote separately to argue that these recommendation algorithms, by amplifying and directing content, went beyond merely publishing third-party content. So now the question before the Supreme Court is who has the better of the argument and whether Section 230 immunizes platforms from liability 
when they use these recommendation algorithms. So now I'm gonna hand it over to the panelists uh, to talk about this uh, and they'll give some opening statements. Um, as they do, I will just remind everyone to feel free to use the Q&A function uh, if you have questions um, that you're interested in hearing our panelists discuss. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and start with Ash. Thank you so much. I'm not gonna do more of a statement. I wanna provide a little more color and then I think it would be best for everyone to jump into the discussion. There's different levels of how our audience is, you know, acquainted with Section 230. I do want to add a few more touches on where it comes from, because I think we're going to talk about the congressional history a little more uh, later in the panel. So that case you mentioned, also for some color, I'm sure many people have seen Wolf of Wall Street. That was actually that firm, Stratton and Ackmund, suing Prodigy um, for this website. They were hosting forums, and I believe on some of the forums, people might have alleged that uh, they, the Stratton Oakmont, um, Jordan Belfort, I believe his name was, right? Um, Leo DiCaprio's character in Wolf of Wall Street, that their firm might have been engaging in some not so super legal activity. And they sued and they won. And what the court took into account was that Prod Prodigy as a website was, um, they were looking, they were moderating. They, they, they were moderating, they were trying to create um, somewhat of a good environment uh, for their users. And the second case, sorry, I need more coffee. The second case was CompuServe. And in CompuServe, it was the opposite. The platform was found not to be liable because the court said they didn't know what was going on on the platform because they were not moderating at all. Those two cases, or what uh, Christopher Cox, then representative, Republican representative from California, read on his way back to DC and then met with Ron Wyden, back then representative, now Senator, Democratic Senator from Oregon. And they discussed that this was a very wrong incentive that um, led to either horrible things being hosted on the internet, like very hands-off or over-moderation on those back then 9095 platforms. And that's when they wrote what became Section 230 was a separate bill that was then in the legislative process merged with a Communications Decency Act and uh, passed in 1996. Uh, I believe a year later in Reno versus ACLU, the Supreme Court found the Communications Decency Act that dealt with indecency online to be unconstitutional, except for the part that is Section 230. And since then, it, it went pretty untouched until SESTA FOSTA in 2018, but that's not what we're talking about here. And a lot of people do credit Section 230 with the creation of the internet as we know it. Uh, it allowed platforms to not be liable for third party user generated content. And um, I think created a very diverse, uh, online, I would say, ecosystem that keeps developing as we go. You know, we had MySpace, we had, had AOL. Now we have Google and Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and TikTok has emerged into the scene. And all of them are using Section 230 as their liability shield against a very litigious system that is the United States. Now let's talk about Gonzalez v. Google. Aside from Bruno versus ACLU, Section 230 hasn't really been to the Supreme Court. And I would say it was a very surprising case uh, when it was granted cert. Even the smartest legal scholars were uh, not expecting it. There is no circuit split um, so far on all the cases of algorithmic recommendations being protected by Section 230. The circuit courts have said yes. I believe um, the Second and the Ninth Circuit, the most recent ones, the, the thing about the Ninth Circuit and the Gonzalez case there was there was a dissent that said, if we were not bound by this precedent, we would have ruled, if we're not bound by previous precedent, we would have ruled otherwise. And uh, that was used by the petitioners as an argument that there is a circuit split or they could have been a circuit split. Very stretched legal argument, I would say, but that's not you know that important here. The cert was granted. I would say the way the petition was written, um, and we were talking about Justice Thomas, um, it definitely corresponded what Justice Thomas has said in his statements about Section 230 previously. Um, and th that might have been what um, triggered the interest. 
Now, the thing about algorithmic recommendations is that basically everything we see on social media platforms is algorithmically recommended one way or another. It might be, you can argue even that a chronological feed is algorithmically recommended recommended because Twitter has decided that here's an option. You want to have a chronological feed, you press on it. We have created an algorithm that will line it up for you. That's also a recommendation. And then you go from that to you know, targeted recommendations. Uh, there's a lot to be said about targeted recommendations and how they work. Um, every single platform uses a variety and a majority and you wouldn't know what exactly, I don't think even platforms know how many algorithms at the same time are creating specific user experience. But the prime real estate that is the newsfeed or the, the whatever version of newsfeed the platforms have is that the platforms are looking at, okay, who you are as a user and what other users with similar profiles are interested in. That's one. Second one is what is a trending topic right now in general? What are um, issues that people are interested in? And that's how algorithmic recommendations are created. Now, if court grants what petitioners are asking for, if court says, yes, Section 230 does not protect targeted algorithmic recommendations, I don't see a lot of the current social media platforms and the way they operate surviving. Um, for example, Google, um, just all in, in itself. Uh, that's how broad that question is. And that's how surpri- that's why I started from a little far. That's how surprising it is that we have gotten here this fast. Um, I would also mention that there's a variety of options that the court can go with as they limit it. Uh, But as we're talking about Section 230, as we're going to talk about C1, because I know Joel and Randy have a lot to say about it, uh, it is important to remember what is at stake here. And it is the future of the internet as we know it. And I'm not trying to be dramatic. But there is a big difference between how U.S. operates and U.S. legal system operates from everywhere else in the world. And that's why we do have Section 230. And also that's why we have the leading tech companies in the world. And at that, I'm gonna pass it over to Joe. Well, well, first, thanks, Ash. And also first, thank you to the Federal Society for hosting this important discussion. I think whether you are on the side of Section 230 reform, like my friend Randy, or a Section 230 purist, like my friend Ash, we can all agree that this case will set the tone for broader conversations on internet regulation. Uh, But today, I think it's best to have a more focused discussion, especially one that articulates what this case is about and what it's not. Uh, For example, this case does not address the issue of online censorship. That would be questions better suited under Section 230C2, which is not being discussed in this case. But fear not, culture warriors. This case could fix serious issues with previous court interpretations of Section 230. Frankly, uh, court precedent on Section 230 has made it virtually impossible to hold these tech companies accountable when they harm consumers. The reason? Case law on this issue is divorced from the tenets of statutory construction. Now, the formal question presented to the court at bar is under what circumstances does the defense created by Section 230C1 apply to recommendations of third-party content? Fundamentally, this case asks a relatively simple question. What does the text of Section 230C1 actually say and do? So let's start with the text of the section at issue. Section 230C1 says, and I quote, no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. You'll notice there's no mention of immunity or from what an interactive computer service would be immune. All the statute says is that we cannot treat interactive computer service providers or users, in this case, Google's YouTube, as the publisher or speaker of a third party post, such as a YouTube video. That is all. Warped interpretations from courts, starting with Zeron v. AOL, have drastically moved away from the text of the statute to find Section 230C1 as providing broad immunity to civil actions. 
Such civil actions include basic torts, liability under civil statutes, and yes, the courts have even construed Section 230 to overcome breach of contract claims. Case in point, Murphy v. Twitter. These immunities aren't written in the statute. They are court-created. And I have yet to hear a textual argument otherwise. This case, I hope, can rectify that. Boyd touched on this a bit, but I think it's important to take a deeper dive into the facts of this case. This case comes to us from the Ninth Circuit. The original plaintiffs are, me are family members of Noam Gonzalez of a fatal ter terrorist act in Paris, which were committed by affiliates of, of ISIS. The plaintiffs originally claimed that Google violated the Anti-Terrorism Act for knowingly providing material support to the group through its platform. The Ninth Circuit held that because Google was acting more in a publisher capacity, it was entitled to Section 230 immunity. But frankly, after reading the Ninth Circuit's opinion several times over, I must admit I was a little confused. The Ninth Circuit in this case here waffles on Google being a neutral platform and at the same time a sort of publisher, only to ignore all of that waffling to grant immunity to Google. Worse, there is no conversation as to why the text supports providing Google with this level of immunity. Immunity, mind you, that would not be afforded to the Wall Street Journal had it written about these videos or a movie theater that had played these videos for you, or even you if you recommended them to a friend. Google gets immunity because, hey, they're Google. This highlights the problems with how courts have applied Section 230. The courts follow a standard formula. Because we're not sure what tech companies do, if it's a website or app and the case involves third-party content, we'll just grant immunity. Chief Judge Katzman of the Second Circuit admitted as much in his concurring opinion of critiquing the majority opinion in Force v. Facebook, which is a case that has sim a similar fact pattern and causes of action under the ATA. Frankly, we need a better test to determine when Section 230C1 applies. I argue that the text should be our guide. One option, advanced also by several senators, is that tech companies should only be protected from causes of actions that target a speaker or publisher, such as defamation. Another option would be to shield companies from liability for hosting and displaying content, but hold them responsible when they take actions beyond those of a publisher. Yet another possibility arises. Going back to the original sin of Zoran, would, would be to allow actions to proceed only under a distributor liability theory. Neither the statute nor the structure of Section 230 suggests that the court cannot apply a traditional distributor liability test to Google in this instance. In that case, the court, sh uh, the court should remand the case for the parties to argue whether Google knew or should have known that ISIS was using its platform as a recruiting tool. But in any case, the statute does not support the current reading of Section 230C1 that shields tech companies from liability under practically all causes of action when third-party content is involved. That is just an absurd result, and it's also detached from basic statutory construction. But one last point. Courts need to stop being mystified whenever the word algorithm is invoked. An algorithm is just a way of making a decision, nothing more. Humans program those algorithms. They aren't created on high. And given the revelations of the recent Twitter and Facebook files, it's clear that algorithms aren't the only thing running the show at these tech companies. Manual intervention is a regular practice when it comes to content moderation. And so, whether it's this case or another, I hope courts will start treating tech companies like everyone else. If we are truly all equal under the law, and our courts are in fact the great levelers, then justice demands no less. Thank you everyone for your time. And I'm uh, interested in the further discussion. Okay, uh, Boyd, I think it's uh, over to me now. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks to the Federalist Society for hosting this, Boyd, uh, to you for moderating and um, to my fellow panelists, Ash and uh, Joel, 
uh, you've actually, uh, I think, set this up nicely and uh, provided a good base for uh, an on- ongoing uh, discussion. Uh, before I dive in, I have to say when Boyd introduced me and he said that I've been in the weeds of telecom for over four decades, it, it has been that long, but uh, I feel like there's still a lot of weeds that are still there, so I'm not I'm not sure how, how much I've accomplished at pulling some of those out. Uh, and then, you know, Ash said something that made me think also for a moment during her presentation when she said towards the end, uh, something to the effect that if if uh, Section 230 is altered, I think in any meaningful way, that that could be the end of uh, or the uh, end of the Internet as we know it. And that called to my mind, you know, uh, what we heard back, you know, a few years ago when we were having that discussion about that other favorite topic, net neutrality, when, uh, you know, we thought that might be the end of uh, the Internet as we know it, if net neutrality were repealed. But I guess we're still using the Internet uh, today. So that didn't that that didn't happen. Uh I want to take this discussion in a little bit of a different direction because part of this program, I think, today as we conceived it and build it is to think about uh, assuming that uh, regardless of what the court does, that that Congress could decide to reform uh, Section 230, conceivably even repeal it. You know, President Biden has said he would like to repeal Section 230, and uh, his predecessor uh, did as well. Uh, so, you know, I think uh, we, we can think about what would be uh, a sound replacement, a proper replacement for S- Section 230 if it were modified in some way, uh, you know, or conceivably even uh, repealed. Uh and, and, you know, to put it in blunt terms, what sh- should be the extent of immunity that's granted uh, to the platforms uh, in that regard? Uh, and when I think about it, I think when we all think about it, uh, you know, we one question is whether there's a difference that we should acknowledge between an absolute bar uh, uh, to liability on the one hand, and even a broad (laughs) bar to immunity on the other hand, because I think what we have now, I think we could all agree, at least as I understand the the cases, we have have an absolute bar to immunity, or uh, at least a near absolute bar to immunity. Uh, I think another thing, you know, that we ought to think about that's pretty fundamental, but you know, it gets lost sometimes and you have to, I think, have it in mind is whether there's a difference, uh, a a difference between exercising editorial control over content on the one hand uh, and engaging in conduct relating to the distribution of content on, on the other hand, and whether you can acknowledge that difference. And if so, how you would treat those diff- differently in terms of establishing liability. Uh, you know, to put a point on it, in my mind, if, if you're talking about editorial control of content, uh, I, I understand the First Amendment. I've been a strong First Amendment defender, and I understand the interest, uh, First Amendment interest involved uh, when you talk about uh, what I consider to be uh, editorial control over over content. Uh, it doesn't always trump everything, but uh, under the First Amendment, it's pretty darn important, right? Uh, so when I think about fashioning a what I would consider to be a proper regime uh, to, to deal with this question we're discussing, uh, I like to think about a law and economics approach. You know, we could call it the Chicago law and economics approach. Uh, you know, when you look at uh, cost benefit, uh, uh, the various interest and, in, in, uh, uh, you know, that type of that that type of way. And, and when I do that, 
you know, it leads me to think that you could fashion a regime which would properly take into account the interest of the platforms in being preserved. Uh, I don't want them to go away. <laughs> uh, I recognize the value uh, that they contribute to society, but also the harms uh, that that can result from their existence, over which they don't always have, uh, of course, control. Uh, and it it leads me to think that you could have a regime that would that would rely on a reasonable duty of care uh, that would be workable uh, and, and that would allow them to to perform the function uh, that I think they they really ought to uh, be able to function. And if you do that, if you're if you're fashioning a regime that's based on a reasonable duty of care, uh, I think that would allow you to take and and when I say that, it, this could be Congress fashioning the regime, right? Congress could kind of come up with a new statute. In the absence of Congress doing it, I, I think you know our common law would do it. Uh, I think it. I think Joel referred to the fact that that he, he talked about the equality of how we uh, treated uh, entities and ourselves under our civil justice system, and we have to think about how unique really uh, this problem is that we're dealing with, that we take it out of the ordinary or need to take it out of the ordinary principles of our civil justice system, right? But if you're doing it that way, I, I think that would allow you to, to consider things like the scale of the platform, uh, the number of users, the size of the user base of the platform, the cost of implementing uh, procedures and practices uh, that would uh, enable the platform to comply with its terms of service. Presumably, its terms of service wouldn't be to host uh, content that explicitly urges the commission of terrorist acts. I assume that would probably contravene the um, terms of service. So you would take into account uh, those types of uh, those types of things. Uh, you know, I think basically, uh, and I want to acknowledge uh, really here I, because it's worth reading, and I want to also give credit. Uh, Jeff Manny and and uh, Kristen Stout and Ben Sperry put out a paper about a year and a half ago that I think is well worth reading in terms of was a very serious analysis of, of uh, the pros and cons of the type of regime I'm talking about. That that paper uh, uh, is called Who Moderates the Moderators? And uh, you can find it at the International Center for Law and Economics. And, you know, I give them credit for that. You know, but basically they, they say, and then I think I'll end with this so we can continue the discussion. But in that paper, uh, they say... Uh, Quote, counting the cost of defending meritorious lawsuits as an avoidable and unfortunate, unfortunate expense is tantamount to wishing away our civil justice system. And so, you know, I think in order to, to get to a what I would consider to be a proper resolution of this issue we're talking about that balances the need for the robust discussion that we want to have uh, uh, as, as in our public square uh, with the need uh, not to escape all liability for what I consider to be conduct uh, 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 that they ought to be re responsible for. Uh, we don't want to completely uh, uh, forget about the availability of our civil justice system to deal with this issue. Boyd, I think with that, I'll, I'll stop so we can keep moving along. Thanks so much, Randy, um, and to Ash and Joel for um, really interesting thoughts. Um, before we jump into Q&A, I just wanted to give everyone a chance to go around the horn one more time and give kind of a brief statement or thoughts uh, reacting to um, what your fellow panelists have said. Uh, so I guess we'll start again with Ash. 
I try to write down all the things I wanted to react to. And then I gave up because it was too many. Um, but I wanted to say a few things. Joel said that platforms are not like Wall Street Journal. But if you think about it, um, the way you recommend content is the way Wall Street Journal decides to place articles in a certain, you know, highlight this one, put this one on the first page, put this one in the back kind of way. Um, you also, Joel, you kept talking about text, statutory text. And I think that's a great thing to talk about. So both the authors of Section 230, Ron Wyden and Chris Cox, have filed an amici brief in this case. And also internet policy scholars that include UG, Professor Eugene Volok, amongst others, also have filed in this case. And I count both the people who wrote the law and are very much in great health and mind right now. And the people who have studied this before I was even born as my guiding lights in this question. And what they seem to uh, both say is that, actually, no, they did mean to cover recommended recommendations under this. I mean, first argument comes from, well, Section 230 also has the F provision that says, and I'm just going to read, but it says, Internet of Computer Services would pick and choose content to am amplify, organize, filter, screen, and reorganize third-party content. That pretty much sounds to me like algorithms. And the other thing that I think we need to really step back and think about is that when the language was put into the statute that said publisher or speaker, it wasn't it wasn't any kind of way to distinguish or say that this is different from distributor liability. And also 101 and distributor liability, I think a good example would be the Smith versus California case. Um, the book was called Sweeter Than Life, and it was a bookstore that was selling it. And it was about, I believe, a lesbian businesswoman. And uh, California tried to go after Smith and even put him in jail for a little bit for selling that book. And then court, uh, the Supreme Court, the case went up to the Supreme Court and they found him to be not liable because he didn't know that the book was even there. He didn't know what was in the book. And that's kind of uh, secondary distributor liability, disseminator of information standard that is often used in distributor liability. So from the moment, moment you have the knowledge, um, you are liable if that content still exists. And I think if that was the case, uh, again, these systems would crumble. Uh, from the moment that I email YouTube to some customer service email and say, hey, actually you have content that's uh, in some way, way or form illegal or harmful or objectionable, whatever it is, they're supposed to take it down. The difference between the internet and any other form of uh, forum that we have had before is its scale. And it is that scale that makes it great. And it is that scale that makes it hard to just manage. But just once again, um, the Internet Policy Scholars brief, people who have taught me and have taught many generations of First Amendment scholars, does argue that actually the statutory language takes from common law language, the publisher or speaker, and puts it in there to distinguish it and say, this is different from distributor liability. And that's why it's there. And that is why I was very surprised because I would say Justice Thomas, it is more of a textual guy um, that he went down that route. Um, but we do have congressional history and all this information and people who have wrote Section 230 saying this over and over. And I will tweet links to this because I don't wanna you know, recite them. That's not a good use of any of our time but I would encourage everyone who is interested to read these. Um, and there was another thing. Oh, Joel said that algorithms are mystified, mystified creatures. And I would agree to some degree. Um, at the same time, I I think I've, in the decade that I've worked in this space, um, there is a lot of misunderstanding about what algorithms are and what they do. And they also overlap a little bit uh, with the questions of privacy and how we regulate privacy because a lot of what algorithms do is based off of data about the users themselves. Um, but at the same time, I didn't say this at the offset, I work now at Stand Together. Um, and, but before that I was at a tech company, I did not represent any, any tech company right now or any of my experience. But there is a myriad of algorithms that are constantly at play that do create all of this. And on that, I'm gonna stop talking and give it over to Joel. 
Yeah, and I'm, I only had a few comments really. Um, so, uh, well, for one, I think that um, I'm, I'm in somewhat agreement with Randy on a, on a lot of the points, and but I, and so there's not really much to cover there. But on a couple of just points with uh, the Ash product that I thought were interesting. Um, one is the concept that there was a there was no circuit split, uh, and therefore no problem. I'm not saying exactly that. I'm paraphrasing, but I for one, you don't need a circuit split to get judicial review. And the, uh, the, uh, the Supreme Court has a, much, a lot of discretion to take whatever case they want. In fact, it's kind of uh, it's kind of their thing to like not take cases. Uh, the other thing I would say is that uh, I'm glad that we agree that, uh, that Ash and I agree on the Wall Street Journal uh, being somewhat akin to what Google does in certain certain instances, which is the point I was making. I was uh, the point, and I'm sorry if that wasn't clear. The point I was making was that uh, Google, under Section 230C1 and in its interpretation, gets afforded these so-called immunities, a lot of which isn't uh, uh, isn't actually indicated in the statute at all, and even the legislative history. It's it's not as clear cut as. Uh, as Ash represented, but I think that what you're, uh, I think what I'm what I'm trying to articulate here is that why is it that uh, why are why is Google so special? Where when they do something akin to what a newspaper does, uh, they get certain liability, or they get certain sorry immunity. Well, it's in a statute. Okay, I'm okay with that. If if we have been able to articulate exactly that. Hey, um, they are publishers. Okay, then they, and I think even under this legislative history, there's nothing to suggest that it gets that these companies should get broad immunity from every single civil statute or every civil action. Uh, I, I think that there probably makes more sense given that this that Section 230 was essentially written in particular. This uh, provision in particular was written in response to a, a case called Stratton House v. O uh, Stratton, Stratton Oakmont Inc where uh, that case had to do with a defamation case. So clearly Congress was reacting to uh, those types of civil liabilities. They weren't, it's not even remotely clear to me whether you read that through the legislative history or throughout. It wasn't until we got to Zoran is where we get this absurd result where now so, uh, it's you get this broad immunity for almost everything. And so I think that that's where, that's probably where I see the most uh, conflict between what Ash and I, uh, between Ash and I. Uh, also, uh, I the one thing I'll just tie, uh, I'll, to tie all this up is th there was, uh, I'm, I was waiting for the First Amendment to pop up and it did. And so uh, I I don't see the First Amendment as, re as a relevant portion of this conversation. Uh, for one, it's not, a, it's not an issue in this case. And secondly, uh, I'm not clear on any case law that says that the First Amendment guarantees any publisher or provider a, a statutory immunity from a civil suit. So I'm, I'm not entirely sure where that point was going, but those were the only major things that I that I would like to respond to. But yeah, uh, uh, for better or worse, uh, I'll, send, I'll send it over to Randy. Okay, well, I hope it's for better, but thanks, Joel. <laughs> uh, a couple of things, you know, we, there's been a lot of discussion about legislative history here. And, you know, even what was said on a plane ride, I think maybe back from California. But I think, you know, I think one thing we can be sure of is that this present court is probably not going to rely, you know, on the legislative history. I, I don't expect, but it's really going to look at the text of the statute pretty much. I, I'm not saying that the legislative history is not interesting or even important to some people, but it's probably not going to be important here. One thing we haven't mentioned, just for those that are in the audience that are, you know, going to delve further, I want to know the Justice Department filed a, a brief in the case as well, and uh, the government's brief. And if I understood it correctly, you know, maybe someone will correct me, but I, I believe that their position is that there is perhaps a distinction. They ultimately recommended that the case be sent back, I think, for further proceedings uh, below, but that there's a distinction between uh, recommendations uh, that took place in, in this case 
uh, and uh, decisions about placing the con the content being placed on on the platform, and and that the algorithms uh, uh, may not be subject uh, to the bar, the absolute bar from from immunity. Uh, you know when. Some, I think the New York Times was brought up, and then Joel mentioned the the first First Amendment. And I agree, it's not doesn't doesn't on its face appear to be really an issue in this case. It, it it's an issue of text, right? Uh, interpreting the statute, but you know, if we are going back to thinking about when uh, Section two thirty was put in this in in the statute, I don't remember at all an argument being made, a, a serious argument that I can recall, and I was involved uh, back at that time, uh, that the First Amendment compelled the adoption that Congress needed to adopt uh, uh, Section 230, uh, you know, as a matter of First Amendment uh, jurisprudence. And by the same token, I think, any, you know, sometimes it's argued that any tampering at all with 230 to reduce in any way, the uh, extent of the immunity uh, would constitute a, a, a First Amendment violation, and, and I don't think that's true as well. You know, we we have New York Times v. Sullivan, though I think is somewhat relevant and instructive. Uh, that's that's a newspaper. Uh, there was no, there's no statute, I think as Joel pointed out, but nevertheless, there is, <laughs> there is broad immunity for certain types of publications, right? Defamation that takes place and, and a different standards that have been developed under the law. And it happens that with the first amendment underpinning the, the New York times for certain types of, uh, defamation claims gets pretty broad, uh, uh, immunity from liability and not so broad for others. But none of that took place because uh, Congress thought that there uh, had to be uh, a, uh, you know, a Section 230 type of, of statute. And then finally, I would just say, of course, Ash is right that this is a different scale. It's a different medium. And I, I, I appreciate that. I understand. So you can't, you know, it's not uh, it's, it's not equivalent to other types of mediums precisely. But again, it doesn't mean that the civil justice system can't adapt uh, and, and can't end up at a place uh, that might be more appropriate in terms of balancing the interests uh, at stake in, in maintaining uh, a, a robust discussion in the public square but also protecting the public from certain types of conduct that probably all of us think are pretty egregious types of conduct, at least some of the some of them. Thank you, Boyd. Yeah. Great. Thank, thanks, Randy. Um, and thanks, Ash and Joel. Um, so we'll now uh, go into questions. I'll just remind everyone, um, feel free to use the Q&A function um, and ask questions. I'll be monitoring those. Um, but I guess I'll start things off. Um, I have a question for Joel. Um, so Joel, is there something about recommendation algorithms that's different uh, than traditional tools employed by publishers that allow users to find content? So I'm thinking of like, a, you know, a table of contents or even like a website directory. Um, like what makes recommendation algorithms different from those? Or, it, you know, is it different? Would you say that those are Covered by well, I, I still oh, no I still think there's an efficiency difference. I mean, I mean, there's no doubt that uh, algorithmic uh, mechanisms provide you information faster, quicker. Uh, I think the issue that I uh, issue I see here is that uh, whenever courts seem to talk about algorithms, they talk about it as this uh, almost monolith. Like there's no interaction between the uh, inputs from humans on the on the algorithm or the makeup of the algorithm and the result. So I pointed to the Twitter files as being an example of that. There, uh, I mean, for a long while, both Facebook and Twitter uh, said that, well, we're not, you know, censoring X or doing X or doing Z or uh, because, you know, these are all our algorithms. They're not really us doing it. But it turns out that, well, there was a little bit more interaction with 
uh, there was more of a human element interaction uh, in the curation process. So my, my point really isn't to uh, further distinguish. It's just to say that I don't think simply saying, oh, an algorithm did it is enough. Like you can't, uh, and especially if you're looking at statutes like the ATA, which doesn't really re require a publishing uh, mandate in order for it to be in effect. So the question, and this is where it goes back to what Justice Thomas was saying in, uh, um, I'm, forgive me, I forgot the case, um, but uh, his- his malware bites. Malware bites, thank you. His concurrence in malware bites, where he, uh, his big issue with section 230C1 was that, you know, um, given the current textual, uh, uh, given the relevant text, there doesn't seem to be any real bar from them to look at this through distributor liability. So even if we say algorithms are different and they are more of like a neutral platform sort of mechanism, that doesn't mean that uh, that's where the uh, that, that's where the uh, analysis stops. Now let's look at distributor liability and see how that works. But again, I think throughout this entire conversation, and I think uh, um, Randy did a pretty uh, very good job of this, which, uh, we haven't had a real, like, I haven't seen a textual argument either here or anywhere else that says that um, there should be immunity for these things just because an algorithm exists. So, Boyd. I'm sorry. sorry. Well, Boyd, I, th I think, maybe another way of thinking about it, or at least a question that I have in, in my mind is, we, here we're talking specifically in this case about videos that I think everyone agrees were urging uh, others to commit terrorist acts that presumably all of us here, hopefully in the audience, would would think would would not be a good thing. That that's a, that's a that's a bad thing, presumably, and 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 if that's the case, and 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 also, uh, let's assume that the algorithms were uh, promote were promoting or or making those videos more available than they otherwise would be under some other type of algorithm or no algorithm at all, perhaps, wouldn't we want to know? You know, assuming we agree that that videos promoting terrorist acts are not not a, a, a good thing and that even Google would not necessarily want to see that happen. Wouldn't we want to find out more about how the algorithms work and whether it would be reasonable, whether whether it ought to be reasonable for for Google to take some actions uh, so that that doesn't happen? And maybe those actions would be. Uh, too costly in some way that I'm, I I wouldn't necessarily understand, but maybe they wouldn't be, and and that would be that would be the type of analysis that I would like, to, or the type of under uh, consideration that I think would be relevant under the the type of regime that I would like to see in place. I would like to tie two things Joel and Randy said. Uh, Joel, you talked about uh, the Anti Terrorism Act, which I think actually important piece of this that we didn't mention at all is the Tomney case. Uh, so there's actually a second case that Supreme Court also granted cert, um, which is uh, Twitter versus Tomney. And in it, the Anti-Terrorism Act is the one in question. Um, and uh, the question in front of the court is if Twitter aided and embedded terrorism by hosting um, terrorist content uh, that led to the 2017 Istanbul bombings and the family of the victim there is uh, arguing that. Now, um, Randy, you said uh, that uh, you were talking about terrorist videos. And, and the thing that I wanted to mention is there is no direct link in either of these two cases between the videos and the terrorists and the horrible, horrific things that have happened, right? It's just very high level that the, the videos exist. Um, so that's I think important to mention these cases. Another interesting bit that I think uh, viewers would find fascinating is that Justice Kagan was Solicitor General in the Force v. Facebook that you, Joel, mentioned. Um, and so she might have, I mean, we're all speculating, but maybe she was one of the four votes that got one of these two cases to be granted cert. Uh, she might have an interest and uh, want to address this issue. Um, but the thing about the platforms and horrible illegal content is that 
none of the platforms want to host them. None of the platforms want to uh, be even associated with it. Even the platforms that are more hands-off when it comes to their moderation, like Twitter is. And I think when these cases took place, which was almost 10 years ago, they just had less developed systems of addressing and finding the content. And with every year, they get better and better in it, at it. Um, and in Europe, the, the way free speech works is different. They also are not as litigious as the United States, but they have a very big chilling of free speech because con- platforms over moderate the content and even reporting from regions like Syria leads to uh, being taken down or there's huge over moderation of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict because of, again, the regulations that are in place. And obviously Europe doesn't have anywhere close to the First Amendment protections that we have here, but that's important to remember. But at the same time, like if the State Department here designates a group as a terrorist organization, like name a name a platform that doesn't take their content down when they find it. Got it. Um, thank you all. Um, just I, I know we're approaching the, the top of the hour, so I'm just going to move on um, and ask a question uh, from. Hey, before we do, uh, Boyd, can I, I, I'm sorry, I really just want to respond to a couple of things because I think that this might resolve some of the issues here. So, so for on the Twitter case, on the ATA case, that question has to do with whether or not the ATA is a criminal statute, which would uh, which would allow the, the case to be heard on the merits. I think that why those things are important is mainly because Section 230, uh, the way it's been read, has been read so broadly that we now have to find interesting, innovative ways just to hear the cases on the merits. Now, whether or not there's a causal link between uh, the terrorist activity and what actually happened at this point is irrelevant. The question is, can we hear the case on the merits, not whether or and and what or. Uh, whether Section 230 actually provides as a bar in the, uh, to those claims. That's what this case is about. So getting bogged down into whether algorithms were good, bad, the ugly. Well, let's get first the case to the merits and describe what happened. And then we can be able to describe whether or not Google was liable or should have done something or not. So that's what I, that's all I thought. Mean. Thanks, Joel. Um, so this next question um, is for you, Ash. Um, and uh, so this comes from the audience. Um, and so your your statutory argument seems to depend on like legislative history and legislative intent. Um, is do you have an argument that's uh, independent of kind of the legislative history that's just the text for why recommendation algorithms um, should be considered publishing? So Yes. And the whole point is that it shouldn't be publisher or a speaker. That's the text. They took it from common law and they put it in Section 230 to avoid this. It's like a very weird fallacy that keeps reappearing in it. And uh, there are a few fallacies around Section 230 that keep coming up. But the whole point is that it doesn't matter if it's a publisher. It doesn't matter. Um, and that's why it was written the way it was. And I guess I'm citing legislative history and um, the offers of Section 230 just to prove my point because they're saying the same thing. It shouldn't matter. Uh, And that's the difference also with like, you know, with Wall Street Journal. Um, Like it shouldn't matter that platforms are a publisher. Um, And there is a big difference there, but I'll, I'll stop there. There's also another question for me, but I'll let you moderate the questions. Great, thanks. Um, So, Randy, I've got a question for you. Um, So on your reasonable duty of care um, kind of thinking and like your law and economics thinking about how Section 230 should work, is that something that you think Congress would have to do or is there a a bona fide reading of the statute uh, that could support that interpretation? Yeah, no, I think probably Congress would have, have to do it. Uh, or, you know, as I, I, I said, I, I guess if the statute were just repealed, I think under the common law, uh, it, it could evolve or, it, uh, you know, Justice Thomas in the Malware Bites case, I think at the end of that opinion, he suggested, you know, uh, even state liability laws could could evolve to, to do that. But the answer is, I don't think it would 
It's going to be done under the current statute as it stands right now. Got it. Thanks, Randy. Um, and since we're close to the top of the hour here, um, I guess I'll just ask one last question um, for the group, um, just to uh, give some closing thoughts here. Um, how will the the impact, or how will Gonzalez versus Google impact both Section Two Hundred and Thirty and kind of the future of the internet? Um, and yeah, just interested to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, we'll start with you, Ash. I'll try to be very short. I, I think that it, it will absolutely, no matter how uh, the court rules, is going to impact the way legislators think about this. I also think given this conversation is shifting the overturn window about on how we think about social media platforms. Um, and there, we already see proposed regulation legislation on state and federal level that addresses algorithms uh, in many different ways and forms. So I think this is just the first harbinger and uh, there is the Tomney case and there's, we, I think we should get a prize because we didn't mention Texas or Florida once in this panel, uh, but there is uh, two cases that are probably gonna be heard sometime later next year, but definitely are teed up that are gonna actually talk about C2 that we also didn't mention, so yay to us. Um, and they're going to reshape the speech as we know it. And I'm gonna pass it on to Joel. Yeah, I think that uh, I'll, I'll close up really quick. Um, I think that, again, um, textualism will play a big role here. And for the, on a textualist perspective, I think the courts can adopt uh, the late Justice Scalia's viewpoint on reading a text, which Congress doesn't hide elephants in mouse holes. So if like there is that broad immunity, you have to demonstrate that in the text. Like, you can't just read it in. I think in terms for the policy moving forward, uh, if it goes in favor of Gonzalez, uh, then I think that you're going to see a greater impetus for a lot of these tech companies to come to Congress and try to either remedy it. But at the very least, I think we're going to have a broader conversation, as I said on the top of my comments. I I, I truly think that no matter if, uh, how this goes, there's always another opportunity. There's I think with Section 230, there's always going to be another bite at the apple. Uh, but I think if it goes in the way of Gonzalez, we're probably going to see more action on the Hill and probably get more of a compromise because, you know, uh, for, from the tech hub's perspective, it would, in their view, be a bad case law. But uh, I'll pass it on to Randy. Well, I'll go out on a limb and, and make a prediction that I, you know, I think in some way that uh, uh, this is not going to be a, a clean victory for Google and uh, the other platforms and uh, the, and the amici that are arguing for it. I think it'll it'll be sent back at least for some tweaking. I, I don't think the court, Joel again referred to broad immunity, but I mean, I, my understanding of this case law is it's almost really what I would call absolute immunity. And you could end up at a place <laughs> where there's broad immunity uh, that's not absolute, which might be uh, a place to end up at the future. I, I think it, it one way or another, I think this the conversation obviously is going to continue, as Ash pointed out. And I've I've been really, I hope, uh, studious and restraining myself from talking about some of the broader issues, uh, you know, because my own predisposition, I'm, I'm concerned about too much censorship of what I, I would consider consequential issues. But we haven't, that's not this discussion as Joel reminded us, reminded me at the beginning. But the, what I would say is, uh, you know, uh, let's be honest, this this statue was uh, adopted uh, over a quarter century ago. And, you know, I said, I don't think the First Amendment compelled it, but I could I could certainly be sympathetic to the notion that it was a good thing at that time, that it was an appropriate thing and that it was, uh, you know, maybe it was ne necessary for the uh, Internet to get where it is today as, as we know it at some point. But that doesn't necessarily mean that, that in light of the environment that we have now uh, and the way the uh, platforms have emerged and some of the difference between the really large ones, I don't even want to say big tech, <laughs> I'll just say some of the really large ones and all the hundreds of thousands of other ones, that it's not possible to, or, or that we shouldn't revisit you know, Section 230 now, aside from what the court does, and 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 probably uh, determine that there's 
uh, a way of fashioning a regime that doesn't provide the uh, absolute immunity or the near absolute immunity that Section 230 presently does. So that's that's my closing thought. Thank you so much, Randy, Joel, and Ash, um, all of you. I really appreciate hearing your thoughts today. Uh, great discussion. Uh, and I guess I'll pass it back to Jack now to close us out. Thanks so much, Boyd. Uh, son of a great moderator, of course, is ending right on the hour. And thank you all for joining us today. And thank you to our audience for tuning into today's event. You can check out our website at fedsock.org or follow us on all the major social media platforms at fedsock to stay up to date. Thank you very much.